the head, and he cursed him. Thank you. Unsportsmanlike conduct, Wingate, 15 yards. What? You shut up, you get another 15. This young man plays for my team, my team and I will defend him like he's my own son against you or any other redneck. Don't worry, Coach. I got you, bae. Coach ain't here to protect him now, is he? Dead ball foul. Oh, was he holding? No. Did he hit after the whistle? I don't believe so. Then what was the fight for? I don't know. Excessive blocking. You're kidding me. <laughs> Sorry, Coach. I stopped when I heard the whistle. Where were you taking him, Mike? To the bus. It was time for him to go home. Would you get my back? Would you take my car when I start to crack? Would you rescue me? Uh -huh. Would you rescue me? Would you rescue me when I'm by myself? When I need your love, if I need your help, would you rescue me? Uh -huh. Would you rescue me? It's all right, Coach. I have your back. So we are in week three of a series of messages entitled "I Got Your Six. And for those of you who may be just joining us and may not be familiar with this particular expression, it comes from the military, it comes out of the Air Force, it has to do with having someone's back. Uh, airplane pilots, when they're flying in formation or in some sort of a battle in the air, the way that they um, refer to their proximity to each other is using an analog clock. The pilot said to be facing at 12 o'clock to the right and the left of the three and the nine o'clock and then straight behind the pilot would be his six o'clock. And fighter pilots reassure each other that they have each other's back by protecting the back of the airplane. And so over the last few weeks, we've been talking about the kinds of friends in our lives that assure us that they have our back. And we've been looking at a couple of examples in the scriptures of, of friendships that demonstrate this support and this encouragement of um, relationships with one another We've been uh, using a particular passage of Scripture from the book of Ecclesiastes that talks about uh, the importance of relationships and having each other's back. In the book of Ecclesiastes, we read this, two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor or their efforts. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up. But pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. And then this illustration, a cord or a rope of three strands is not quickly broken. There's power in relationships of loyalty and faithfulness to one another. And so it's wise that all of us consider the aspect of friendships in our lives. And so in this series... We're trying to make the case that everyone should have at least one friend who has your back. So the question I'm asking you, the question I'm asking myself is, do I have the names of people that I know personally and have the confidence that they have my back? When, when I was just a kid, one of my very best friends' name was Jeff Brode. 
somewhere between uh, kindergarten and about the fifth grade, Jeff and I were inseparable friends. Um, a lot of times when people saw us together, they would ask us if we were twin brothers. We were kind of built the same. We had sort of the same personalities. We both had this um, very, very blonde hair, and uh, we had sort of the same shenanigans uh, in school. Um, we often got in trouble for, I don't know if you can imagine this, uh, talking a lot. Um, but Jeff and I were inseparable friends. We played Little League together. We ran the neighborhood together. We were just very, very close friends. And um, at times, uh, I remember teachers referring to us as the dynamic duo. Now, what they didn't know was that was actually a compliment because my absolute favorite show to watch every afternoon when I came home from school was Batman and Robin. And Batman and Robin were referred to as the dynamic duo. Now, I'm not talking about the cartoon version. I'm talking about like the real Batman and Robin, all right? They were real people who showed up on my TV screen every day after school. And so I was a faithful fan of the dynamic duo, Batman and Robin. And I think it was interesting now that I um, recall this very important um, habit in my life of watching the dynamic duo was how many of the shows that many of us grew up with that were built around dynamic duos, trusted friendships between people. So I'm going to show you a couple of them, see how quickly you remember um, which ones these are. Um, dynamic duo, Abbott and Costello, comedy team. How about this one? Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. Fred and Barney, Laurel and Hardy, another comedy team. These guys were hilarious. They just get better with age, too, if you can still find them. Um, Bert and Ernie, Calvin and Hobbes. Oh, look at that. Yes, what a great friendship those two shared. Han Solo and Chewbacca. How about this one? Laverne and Shirley. Yeah, last crowd kind of, wait, I think that's who that is, Laverne and Shirley. R2-D2 and C-3PO. Buzz and Woody. You know who this is? Frodo and Sam. SpongeBob and Patrick. I am so thankful as a parent that my boys grew up in this era because I absolutely love SpongeBob. <laughs> one, of my favorite, one of my favorite quotes is, do um, you remember Squidward? It was the other character. He once asked Patrick, Patrick, don't you have somewhere else to be stupid? <laughs> and Patrick said, uh, not until like four. <laughs> That's like my favorite line ever. I just love that show. Um, how about this one? Lone Ranger and Tonto. Again, that was probably my second favorite show to watch growing up. Lucy and Ethel. They were inseparable friends. How about this one? Scooby-Doo and Shaggy. Chandler and Joey. All right, the next one's a test. Ready? You recognize them, and you know that they're Muppets, but do you know their names? Waldorf and Stadler. Okay, now here's the test with the raise of hands. How many of you would know which one's Waldorf? Same thing as the last service. Nobody knows. This is Waldorf here. This is Stadler. You should know this. So these are examples of like trusted friendships, dynamic duos that have really kind of decorated our lives for years. And, and we, we have all these terms that we use, this language that we're familiar with. We may not use all these terms, but we're familiar. So we talk about like dynamic duos and we talk about best friends and we talk about inseparable friends. 
Uh, from time to time, uh, you'll hear this phrase, thick as thieves, people who are in it together and they're just up to no good, but they're going to stick with each other. Um, brothers from another mother. This is a really close friendship. Now, I may not use this language, but you're familiar with it. Besties and BFF, best friends forever, right? So I want to talk a little bit today about friendships. I want to talk a little bit about trusted and true friends. You know, Unfortunately, because of social media, I think there's a lot of confusion nowadays or a lot of misunderstanding about what a friendship is. I mean, when you think about it, in places like um, Facebook and Instagram and Twitter, um, social media has grossly distorted our understanding of what it means to be a friend and to have a friend. We can look at our Facebook page and we could say, I got 600 friends on my friends list. But the truth of the matter is, how many of them are actually true friends of yours? We have to understand that there's a world of difference between a friend and a follower. So what we're talking about today, we're talking about true friends. I want to talk about true friends. I want to ask from two different questions. I want to ask, um, first of all, do you have some friends that you would describe as true friends? That's the first question. The second question is, are you a true friend? And what characterizes a true friend? So here's the deal. If you have true friends, if you have true friends, you have to understand they're rare. They don't come a dime a dozen. Most people don't have a lot of true friends. You may have acquaintances. You may have some casual friends. You may have some close friends. You may have some good friends. But to have a true friend, they're rare. If you have only a couple of them in your lifetime, you should be extremely grateful. And if you happen to have several of them, you are exceedingly wealthy in what truly matters. Because in the end, friendships are the most valuable possession that we have in all of life. So if you have several true friends, we ought to be incredibly grateful and recognize just how wealthy we are. And then the last question, and I'm not intending to be snarky, I want us to, to wrestle with this, is that if you don't have any true friends, we need to figure out why. Why is it that I can't come up with a name or two quickly of people that I would describe as being my true friends? It's interesting. I'm very curious about this particular discussion about our friendships and how we kind of characterize the relationships we have with other people. And it's interesting when you get into a, a discussion about somebody with somebody and you ask them, do you have any true friends? And they hesitate or they can't really think of anybody that's a true friend. What, what I find interesting is that oftentimes they always blame that on everybody else. The reason that they don't have any true friends is because of the failure of other people. I think what we have to do is we have to be a, little bit, a bit more honest about that and ask, am I the kind of person who attracts and nurtures and keeps true friends? Am I a true friend so that other people would be that way toward me also? See, here's the deal. is Sometimes many of us are completely ignorant or we just won't acknowledge some of our own dysfunction and some of our own social um, oddities, some of our own arrogance, that we actually dispel people away from being close to us. I'm talking today about what we might need to understand about what it takes to have a true friend as much as having true friends. So we're going to talk about this today, and I, I'm hoping that um, this will be valuable to us. So true friends, a true friend is somebody who is true to you. Now, what do we mean by that? I, three things that I, I think I want to um, bring to our attention. First of all, a true as in loyal. A true friend is somebody who's loyal to you. Somebody who's with you thick and thin. Somebody who's with you no matter what you do or how many times you do it, but somebody who will stick with you, who has your back over time. Somebody who's loyal. Second thing is true as in honest. A true friend is somebody who feels the comfort and the courage to be able to tell you the truth to be completely honest with you about things that you may need to hear. Now, a true friend is somebody who can be honest with you without being mean. 
I think all too often, in our, especially in our contentious culture that we live in today, people have forgotten how to say the truth and how to be honest without it having some sort of an insensitive or rude edge. A true friend is somebody who's able to be sensitive and understanding of what's going on in your life and tell you the truth about something you may need to know and understand, but they do it without attack. I love this passage in the book of Proverbs about wisdom. Wounds from a friend can be trusted, but an enemy multiplies kisses. What's the wisdom? The wisdom is that a person who's not really your friend will just tell you what you need to, what you want to hear. But a true friend at times may tell you the hard things, the things that are hard to hear, but they are truly your friend because they're willing to help you in that way. And then thirdly, true as in somebody who's trustworthy. Somebody who knows the truth about you and can be trusted with the information that they have, that they're not going to share that with other people who have no vested interest in you as a person. So today we're going to look at one of the truest friendships that we find in the Bible, the ultimate dynamic duo, if you will, in the pages of the scripture. We're going to look at the relationship between David and Jonathan. Now, if we had the time and we don't, I would love to tell you the whole story, but that would take many Sundays in order for us to do that. So I'm going to give you the cheat notes, and that is that if you could just go home sometime today or this week and read 1 Samuel chapter 8, through chapter 31, you'll get the idea of the story of the relationship between David and Jonathan. So to make a long story short, I'm going to give you a quick overview. You guys game? All right, here's some things that I want you to know. Long story short to set up our discussion today. First of all, the story begins chapter 8, uh, chapter 7, chapter 6 of the book of 1 Samuel. Israel asks God to give them a king like the other nations. And you can almost hear the attitude of Israel when they, when they make this request of God. It's like, God, we want, a, we want a king like all the other nations. All the other nations got kings and we don't have a king. And God said, yeah, see Israel, you don't need a king because I'll be your king. I'll take great care of you. I'll watch over you. I'll provide for your needs. I'll make sure that you're protected and safe. I will be your king. And Israel is sort of like a spoiled child saying, yeah, but, but we can't see you all the time. And sometimes you're a little really grouchy. And I don't, we don't always know what you're up to. But if we had a king, that would be cool because like the other nations have kings. And so we read in 1 Samuel that God relented and God allowed the nation of Israel to have their way. And so he provided the king, but he gave the prophet at the time, the the prophet's name was Samuel. And he gave uh, the prophet Samuel some instructions to tell to the nation. And he was, Samuel, you need to communicate this about kings. Is that once a king comes into power, they start kind of getting a big head. And they start thinking that it's all about them. And so here's some things that a king will do. The king will start recruiting your sons to be in his army. And then your sons will go off to battle and they'll die. You need to know that about kings, as they love armies. You also need to know that kings love to live very wealthy lifestyles. And so what they'll do is they'll start collecting taxes. They'll come to your fields and your harvest and they'll take the best percentage of what you brought in and they'll take it for themselves to pay for their luxurious lifestyles. And the other thing that you need to know about kings is that kings kings just think they're a little bit cooler than they really are and so they'll come and they'll recruit your daughters to come and work in the palace and your daughters will cook their food and clean their palace and sometimes their daughters will sleep in their beds with them you need to let the nation of Israel know that if you want a king like all the other nations you will inherit a lot of the challenges and problems that kings with human hearts have and Israel still said yeah but we want a king like the other nations and so God said okay Here's what it'll be. And so God relented, and he appointed a gentleman by the name of Saul as the first king of Israel. And after some initial successes, Saul began to disregard the instructions of God. He did all right initially, but then Saul got a big head. And he started thinking, well, God said that I was supposed to do this, but I'd rather do this. And then God said I was supposed to do it this exact same way, but I thought that wasn't the best way. So Saul started to do it his way. And what happened was that eventually the prophet Samuel informed Saul that God had rejected him as the king of Israel. In other words, 
Samuel had to go to Saul and tell him, you will not be the king of the nation of Israel forever, nor will your family inherit the throne. So God chose a young man. He was a shepherd boy, a no-name. God chose a young man by the name of David to be Saul's successor. Now, here's where the story gets rather interesting is the fact that Saul did not know that the prophet Samuel had anointed David to be the next king of Israel. You see, when God told Samuel to go appoint David as the next king of Israel, Samuel was afraid that Saul would kill him on his task, and so he never let Saul know. And he went and he anointed David as the next king of Israel. And then it gets really interesting from there. It would be nearly 15 years before David would assume the throne, Saul still being the king at the time. And David refused to bring any harm to Saul as the Lord's anointed. David was such a man of faith that he had read the Old Testament instructions that the Lord's anointed was to never be trifled with. And so while David had opportunities to take Saul's life, he refused to do it because he did not believe it would be consistent with a life of faith. And so we read that Saul recruited David into his service not knowing that he was the heir to the throne. Saul recruited David into his service, first as a court musician, then as an armor bearer, and later then as a soldier. As the story continues, David became a highly successful military leader in Saul's army, and Saul became an extremely jealous king of David's success and popularity. And Saul attempted to kill David on three occasions and to have him assassinated on at least two other occasions. So Saul did not like David one bit. And to much of his dismay, Saul's son, Jonathan, who was then the heir to Saul's throne, and David became very close friends, much to Saul's dismay. So to understand the story that we're going to look at, you have to understand these three characters. There's this gentleman who is now the king. He has a son who's the heir to the throne. His name is Jonathan. And then this shepherd boy named David. And David distinguishes himself. And one of the unique features of the story in 1 Samuel 8-31 through is that David and Jonathan become very, very close friends. And so the story goes something like this. After David had finished talking with Saul... Again, there's a whole lot that happens before this. And so this is right after David had slain Goliath, one of Israel's enemies. And after David had finished talking with Saul, Jonathan, Saul's son, became one in spirit with David. Now, we don't use phrases like that. What does that mean? It's basically this. The more that Jonathan understood about the character and the nature of David, the more Jonathan began to think, I like this guy. He's my kind of person. I think I could be a really good friend with him. Jonathan became one in spirit with David, and he loved him as himself. And from that day, Saul kept David with him and did not let him return to his family. He did not let him go back to being a shepherd. He kept them there in the palace to be at service to the king. And Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as himself. We're going to see this phrase again and again because the author is trying to establish the unique nature of their relationship with one another and their friendship. Jonathan took off the robe he was wearing and he gave it to David along with his tunic and even his sword, his bow, and his belt. These are all possessions of the heir to the throne. So Jonathan is essentially saying to David, David, I recognize that you would be a better king than me. I want you to have these things. He's somehow passing the power on to David. Whatever mission Saul sent David on, David was so successful that Saul gave him a high rank in the army. And this pleased all the troops and Saul's officers as well. So you start to see a coalition building around David. And when the men were returning home after David had killed the Philistine, the battle with Goliath, we read this. The women came out from all of the towns of Israel to meet King Saul with singing and dancing, with joyful songs, with instruments. And as they danced, they sang this little ditty that they had evidently composed. And it went something like this. Saul has slain his thousands, and David his tens of thousands. And Saul became very angry. This refrain, this 
repeating of this particular line displeased him greatly. And here's what Saul was thinking. They've credited David with tens of thousands, he thought, but me with only thousands. What more can he get but the kingdom? Everybody's so loyal to him now. And from that time on, Saul kept a close eye on David. You got the feeling so far? It started out pretty good, and then the relationship soured. So at some point in the story, Saul is holding this annual celebration. David, as one of the king's servants, is supposed to be there, but he's afraid to be there because at least on three different occasions, Saul has sought his life. So we pick up the story in 1 Samuel chapter 20. It says, this is a discussion between David and Jonathan, Saul's son. Tomorrow is the new, new moon feast. You will be missed because your seat will be empty. In other words, my dad's going to notice that you're not there. The day after tomorrow, toward evening, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go to the place where you hid when this trouble began and wait by the stone Ezel, so evidently some sort of common meeting spot for those two. I will shoot three arrows to the side of it as though I were shooting out of the target. This is all Saul, uh, Jonathan making this arrangement with David. So Jonathan made a covenant with the house of David saying, may the Lord call David's enemies to account And Jonathan had David reaffirm his oath out of love for him because he loved him as he loved himself. Then Jonathan said to David, then I will send a boy, a servant, an armor bearer, and I will say to him, go find the arrows. And if I say to the servant, look, the arrows are on this side of you, bring them here, then that will be a sign to you, David, then come because you are surely as the Lord lives, you are safe and there is no danger from my father. But if I say to the boy, look, the arrows are beyond you, then you must go. He's saying to David, you must leave because the Lord has sent you away. And about the matter you and I discussed, remember this, that the Lord is a witness between you and me forever. The covenant that David and Jonathan made together is that when David assumed the throne, he would take care of Jonathan's family for all of time a promise that David kept. So um, when Saul eventually realizes that everything's not on the up and up, Saul's anger flared up at Jonathan and he said to his own son, you son of a perverse and rebellious woman. (laughs) You know what that means, right? (laughs) We could have done that in one word. You son of a perverse and rebellious woman, don't I know that you have sided with the son of Jesse? That's David. Don't I know? Can I, can't you, I can see what's going on here. Don't you know that you have sided with the son of Jesse to your own shame and to the shame of your mother who bore you? As long as the son of Jesse lives on this earth, neither you nor his kingdom will be established Now send someone to bring him to me, for he must die. And then Jonathan speaks up. Why should he be put to death? What has he done? Jonathan asked his father, the king. But Saul hurled uh, his spear at Jonathan, his own son, to kill him. Then Jonathan knew that his father intended to kill David. There was no fixing this situation. And Jonathan got up from the table in fierce anger. And on that second day of the feast, he did not eat because he was grieved at his father's shameful treatment of David. And in the morning, Jonathan went out to the field for his meeting with David, this thing that they had arranged. And he had a small boy with him. And he said to the boy, run and find the arrows I shoot. And as the boy ran, he shot an arrow beyond him. And when the boy came to the place where Jonathan's arrow had fallen, Jonathan called out after him, isn't the arrow beyond you? Which was all that prearranged signal. Then he shouted, hurry, go quickly, don't stop. Jonathan communicating to David in the distance, don't hang around here, your life is in danger. And the boy picked up the arrow and he returned to his master. Now the boy knew nothing about all, only all of this. Only Jonathan and David knew what they had arranged. Then David, then Jonathan gave his weapon to the boy and he said, go, carry these back to town. And after the boy had gone, David got up from the south side of the stone, 
he bowed down before Jonathan three times with his face to, a ground, to the ground, an act of humility recognizing that Jonathan could have taken David's life and put him in danger, but he didn't. Then they kissed each other and they wept together, but David wept the most. And Jonathan said to David, go in peace, for we have a sworn friendship with each other in the name of the Lord, saying, the Lord is a witness between you and me and between your descendants and my descendants forever. Then David left and Jonathan went back to town. Did you follow the story? So here's what I want to do. I want to just pull out three observations about the nature of their friendship and what it teaches us about a true friend. First one is this. A true friend is somebody who protects you. A true friend is somebody who's got your six, somebody who watches your back and keeps you from any kind of danger. A true friend is somebody who sticks with you through thick and thin and makes sure that you always have somebody who's got your back. A true friend will protect you. We see this with Jonathan's arrangement with David, that if his father Saul continued to be a threat to his life, Jonathan took the steps to make sure that David would remain safe, even though David was a threat to Jonathan's hope of succeeding on the throne. A few years ago, I was watching a television show. Again, it might date me. Um, Do you remember the show West Wing? My wife and I, we used to watch West Wing all the time. We loved that show. And they used a phrase in one of the episodes I had never heard before, but I found so interesting. In one of the scenes, the president's in the Oval Office with a number of his advisors, and there's a young man that I'll I'll call an intern. He wasn't an intern, but he was very low in the totem pole. And for some reason, he was there in the office with the rest of the advisors and the president. And he knew something that the president needed to hear and needed to understand. And he hesitated. And the president basically said, fire that man because he will not speak to power. I'd never heard that phrase before. The phrase is about having the courage and the confidence to say something to somebody who is your superior, somebody in a higher position, somebody that holds more power. The failure to speak to power is the inability to muster the courage to say the hard truth to somebody who has some sort of power over you. A true friend is somebody who will speak to power on your behalf. So how does that work in real life? Well, sometimes that power isn't always about position. The power isn't always about somebody's authority. Sometimes that power is social. If you ever find yourself in a social setting where other people are talking about a friend of yours who happens to not be in that conversation, and that conversation that is happening is derogatory or critical or mean or judgmental, the question is, will a true friend who's in that conversation stand up and speak to the power that's resident in that particular social setting? Do you have the kind of courage to say something in defense of a friend when they're being criticized or talked about in a way that isn't true of them? You see, a true friend will speak up. There's nothing that I cherish more as a pastor than knowing that I have a few friends who will speak up on my behalf in conversations that I'm not in because I know that that happens quite frequently. My truest friends are people who will stand up for me in the face of criticism. Are you that kind of friend? And do you have those kinds of friends? A true friend will speak to power in your defense. The second um, characteristic of a true friend, a true friend is unselfish. A true friend is willing to share or to give whatever they have so that you could use it. A true friend is not is not stingy with what they possess. It's interesting. A true friend willingly shares what is theirs in the trust that you'd never take advantage of their generosity. Do you understand that? A true friend is somebody who's willingly to, willing to share what they have, whether it's time, money, resources of any kind, because they know that you're not going to take advantage of their generosity. 
I think of friends in my life who have shared amazing things with my wife and I through the years. I think that's all built on the fact that they know that Charlie and I, we wouldn't take advantage of that generosity. We see this in Jonathan and David's relationship. Jonathan gives up his right to the throne to David, knowing that David had made a promise to him that he would protect his family for the rest of his life. Jonathan was willing to share what he had because he had trust in David that David wouldn't take advantage of his generosity. The third characteristic of a true friend is a true friend is loyal. A true friend has your back all the time. A true friend has your back in good times and in bad, through thick and thin, regardless of what kind of mess you find yourself. Are you that kind of friend? And can you name a few people who are that kind of friend to you. That no matter what circumstances or situation you may find yourself, those friends would be loyal to you because the true friend is loyal. Does that make sense? Now, I have a few minutes left. Kind of designed it this way. I want to talk to you about something that's really important to me. And it's rooted in this discussion about the relationship between David and Jonathan. 23 years ago, when I had the opportunity to move from Madison, Wisconsin and start Civil Oak Creek Community Church, I gave a lot of thought to what kind of church I'd like to create, assuming, again, the tremendous help of a lot of people around me. What, what kind of things would be really, really important to me? And there was probably a list of 24 things that I thought, if I could create a church and develop the culture, here's, here's some things. I, I would love to see this happen. Here, here's just a couple of them. One of the things that I was really, really committed to is, could I create a church without traditions? You see, I had grown up in a lot of tradition, and I'd watched traditions become kind of an obstacle to people in their journey of faith. People get so um, accustomed to ritual and routine that they end up losing the meaning of which those traditions were all about. And I said, could, could it be possible to create a church that, that wasn't built around tradition, but just was relevant and authentic and helpful, and we just talked about things that the way things really are? Could we just create a church without traditions? The second thing that was really, really important to me, and it had something to do with tradition, is I wanted to create a church for people who didn't like church people who maybe had never been to church in their life or had been to church and because of traditions they had become disenchanted and they'd walked away from the church or they got beat up by the church or bruised by the church. I was like, could we create a church where people who were new to this, people who didn't necessarily believe in God yet and didn't trust Jesus Christ and didn't know anything about the Bible, could we create a church where that person would feel welcome and engaged in a part of the community that we call the church? The other thing that I wanted I didn't even know the words for it. I just said, hey, could, could we create a church that could be fun? Could we create a church that could be enjoyable? Could we create a church that would talk real language that people talk and ask questions that people ask? And could we do some things that are fun rather than church always feeling like a funeral? Could, could, we, could we make it fun? So go down through the list, and at one point in the list, I wrote this. I wanted to create a church where it'd be completely comfortable, normal, and safe for the men of that church to tell each other that they love them. That one man could say to another man, I love you, without that being misunderstood, without that being uncomfortable, without that being awkward. You see, as a man and as a follower of Christ and spent a lot of time around other men in the journey of faith, I've made some observations that all too many men live very isolated lives. All too many men live as islands. From the youngest years, they're taught big boys don't cry and I don't need anybody. I can do this on my own. And what happens is a lot of men go through their entire life never really knowing that they're loved. Some men grow up in homes where their dads never tell them that they love them. 
I said, God, if you would help me, I'd love to create a church where it's completely comfortable, normal, and acceptable for men to be able to communicate their love for each other, their appreciation for each other. It's so interesting to me that a father can say to his son, I love you, and that's not weird. A son can say to his father, I love you, and that's not misunderstood. If you have family, a brother can say to another brother, I love you. Why can't that be normal in relationships of friendships between men who aren't related by blood? Especially when you stop to think about the church, the way that God describes the church, and Jesus talked about the church, is that the church would be a family. We would be brothers and sisters in Christ, and so it should be completely acceptable for one brother in Christ to tell another brother in Christ, I love you, without that being weird. So here's the thing, to say to one man to say, I love you to another man, it's not weak. But we live in a society that's kind of portrayed that way. And so men refuse to say it to each other. And and it's not strange, It, it shouldn't be. And for Pete's sake, it's not sexual. It ought to be completely normal. But have you ever stopped to think about why it isn't? Why is it awkward? Why is it uncomfortable? Why is it that most men back away from that sort of language toward each other? Well, it's because God has an enemy. You see, God created human beings to live in love to each other. God created all human beings to enjoy the kind of trust, the kind of transparency, the kind of relationship with one another, that it ought to be completely normal for human beings to say to one another, I love you. But Satan, God's enemy, has distorted that. We have to appreciate that Satan's best strategy for destroying the plan of God for human beings is to distort people's trust in each other. One of the best tactics of God's enemies is can I get my foot in the door and sever a relationship, destroy trust, remove closeness so that they live separated, isolated lives from each other. And we see this all through society. The very first step that Satan took in the universe was to try to destroy a relationship of trust between God and human beings. And then we see it in all sorts of relationships the complications and complexities in relationships between men and women, the misunderstandings and distance that so many husbands and wives live together with in marriage, to create a distrust and a lack of respect between parents and children, the elderly and teenagers, rich and poor, black and white, white collar, blue collar, and certainly men to men. Satan loves it when men do not feel safe to be able to tell each other that they love one another. And I'd love to see a church where it was completely normal, completely acceptable, and completely comfortable for one man to say to another man in the context of a trusted friendship, I love you. This past week, I made a covenant with a gentleman in this church he and I were sharing with the fact that um, sometimes we both struggle. We both struggle with consistently reading our Bibles each day. So we challenge each other. I'll hold you accountable if you hold me accountable. It won't be a competition because men are given to that. I'll just ask you, how you doing? And you can ask me, how you doing? And so each day we text what passage from the Bible we read and how many days out of the week so far we've we've read. I loved it this week. He sent me a simple text message. It was simply this, I-G-Y-6. I I love you. I'd love to see a church where it's completely safe for men and for women to reassure each other of their love for one another. Does that make sense? When I was preparing this message, I sat down with a piece of paper and I wrote down, who are my most trusted friends? Who do I consider my true friends? And I came up with this short list of people in my life who allow me to be a person and not just a pastor, 
who have expectations of me that are realistic and understanding, people who I know know a lot about my life and the truth behind you know, the curtain of being a pastor and they still accept me and allow me to be who I am. I love it, the fact that each one of these men, I completely trust them that in another conversation without me in it, they'll have my back. Do you have a few names of people that you know who you could recognize as being true friends of yours? Because everybody needs a few of those. So as we leave, I have an assignment for you. It's real simple. I can't police it. It's up to you, and it's this. This week... Tell your truest friends that you love them. I'll let you figure out how. Maybe it's a phone call. Maybe it's an email. Maybe it's a text message. Maybe you invite them out to lunch or to breakfast. Maybe, maybe you make up something that you feel comfortable with letting the truest friends in your life know that you really appreciate them for being the friends that they are. I'll let you decide how you do that. Make sense? Let me ask you to stand together and let me pray for you. Our Father in heaven, we, we thank you for what we learn in the pages of the scriptures through the lives of people who have lived in history. And we thank you for the unique friendship that existed between David and Jonathan. Their loyalty to one another, looking out for each other, being unselfish toward one another. God, I ask that you would help each of us to be those kinds of friends to the people in our life. And I ask, Father, that in your grace and your favor, you might reward each of us with the knowledge and the confidence that we have a few true friends in our life, and may we be grateful for them. Father, thank you for your love, your faithfulness, your grace toward us. Be with us now this week as we seek to serve you. I pray and ask in the name of Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen.